Well, my guest today is Kathy Cohen, the David and Mary Winton Green Professor of Political Science. Now, you have since also undertaken a very innovative uh, survey type project in, com in collaboration with the National Opinion Research Center, NORC, uh, and that's the Gen Forward project. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Happy to. Gen Forward is kind of the first of its kind monthly survey of young people or young millennials, 18 to 30. We have over samples of African Americans, Latinos, and Asian Americans, so it is representative of the millennial generation which is probably the most racially and ethnically diverse generation that we've seen. And we also want to remember that millennials are now the largest generation, so larger than baby boomers. And hard to access through conventional survey techniques. Absolutely. Um, could you tell a little bit about the work you've done with Gen Forward? Have you actually asked that panel anything about our question today? We have, and you know, uh, let me say that again, we see a divide, a divide between Lakis and Hamantash, uh, with young people of color much more likely to kind of say that they prefer uh, Lakis, and young whites who feel politically alienated, we might say, saying they prefer the kind of sweetness, the kind of nostalgia of Hamantash. But I will say that both groups still have a level of alienation that we've never seen to, to these two food groups before, right? And in fact, they're kind of focused really on a third candidate, a third candidate that seemed more sustainable, that seemed more in line with the goals of their generation. And, and many of them said that they would prefer a bagel to either the Laki or the Hamantash. A bagel to either Laki or the Hamantash? This is actually quite a revolutionary turn. I agree. Does it have implications for the long-term uh, consequences of our of our foods groups? Well, I think it, it means that both those who produce lakis and those who produce hamatash will have to begin to think about how to incorporate some of the kind of making of bagels into their food products, right? So that they can apply and appeal to this new generation of eaters who, in fact, will dominate the country the in the years to come. Absolutely. Now. One of the things we know about surveys is that they're incredibly complex to administer. Um, you mentioned oversampling, yes. which is a technical term that our audience <laughs> may not be aware of. Right. Uh, and it also really matters um, the confidence uh, intervals and it's also how you, how you find <coughs> the questions. I wonder, do you have a kind of margin of error for the Gen Forward oversampling right. uh, on the Latka Hamantash issue? Right. The margin of error is about 4 to 5 percent. However, the differences in terms of preferences, in particular for young people of color, were well outside the margin of error. So I think we have great confidence in the divide and the finding uh, that I report. Our questions, again, were as rigorous and objective as possible. So we ask a question like, would you prefer the kind of savory, delicious sweetness and saltiness of a laka to a kind of muddled, uh, sweet, ruin your teeth hamantash as a way to make sure, in fact, that both presentations were there and, and that neutral. there was no, neutral, totally no neutral. bias, no bias, no bias in terms of how I thought about the question. because. You know, it's, it's very important to me, being a faculty member here at the University of Chicago, that I lead with objectivity and rigor always. Well, this is the kind of data-driven public opinion research for which the political science department at the University of Chicago is justly famous. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Our guest today is Professor Cuthbert Binns, the Clio Professor of History at the, Uni at the University of Chicago. So we are very honored to have him here to talk to us about uh, the Latka versus the Hamantaschen. Professor Binns, how does a historian think about food? What does it mean to do the history of food? There are social historians, cultural historians, environmental historians, historians of religion, historians of food. All of these different approaches need to be taken into account, economic historians even, if we want to think about the Latka and the Hamantash. So in terms of the debate between Latka and Hamantash, how, how would a historian think about the material constraints uh, on the two? From a materialist point of view, I would want to ask, what are the conditions of production of the latka versus the hamantash? Now, in the Middle Ages, the hamantash, which is baked, would have required access 
to forests, to wood, um, to material to burn, much of which was seigneurially controlled. You've heard, of course, from Robin Hood, for example, of the royal forest, the seigneurial forest. On the other hand, the latka, which requires oil, would really have been preferably a food in the south, in the zone of olive growth. For in the north, where you didn't have olive oil, it would have needed to be cooked in butter or animal fat, which sounds disgusting. Professor Bin, does it make any difference to your historical analysis that the potato wasn't introduced into Europe until after the discovery of America and after the end of the Middle Ages? Um, Thank you for joining us, Professor Binns. We very much appreciate your historical expertise. First, I'll say I'm here with Leslie Kay, a professor of psychology at the University of Chicago. My research um, works primarily with rats, although we do foray into mice and sometimes humans. Um, and uh, we study how uh, the olfactory system constructs a, an internal view of the world um, from the animal's perspective. So you're interested in how rats perceive sensory stimuli, particularly odor, right. and how context and experience affect their perception of odor. Yes. Uh, do latkes and hamantashen have odor? They do, and it's really interesting because latkes, you get the odor while you're in, in the area of where you're eating. Right, so you cook them and serve them kind of at the same time. Where um, hamantash and you cook them the day before. So there's a separation there's of a sensory se experiences is right. what you're saying. Right, right. Have you uh, worked at all with rats on this question of how they experience that separation? Um, um, we do actually. We, we, we train them to recognize an odor, like it could be just a latke odor, and then test them the next day on whether or not they recognize that in the context of having, you know, eaten something quite rewarding. And in the case of the rats, it's sugar. Um, but for humans, it could be, you know, a, a delicious latke. Um, Let me just get this straight. From the series of questions I've asked you, I would deduce that you feel that latkes are more beneficial to rats than hamantashen are. Is that correct? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a richer sensory experience, I think, and, and so more pleasurable and better. Well, I don't know if that's an endorsement, but it's a vote for Latkes from the Institute for Mind uh, and Biology and from the research labs of Leslie Kay in the Department of Psychology. Thank you very much for joining us. So I am here with Marshall Solins, the Charles F. Gray Distinguished Service Professor Emeritus of Anthropology and of Social Sciences. You knew. Claude Lévi-Strauss. Yes, I did. Now, Claude Lévi-Strauss is famous amongst many other things for having written books like The Raw and the Cooked, uh, Honey and Ashes, books uh, that were, well, from which structuralism drew its name and that were focused on food. Also great books on kinship. My question to you is, did Claude Lévi-Strauss prefer latkes or did he prefer hamantasha? I didn't know him that well to ask that question. But in any case, uh, what I want to talk about is more derivative from Lévi-Strauss when we come to food, and that's uh, uh, Mary Douglas, actually. Oh, the great anthropologist. The great who spent social some, anthropologist yeah. from Britain who wrote a lot about, um, about actually the Old Testament. and. Uh, I want to take off from something that she wrote uh, of what's called The Abominations of Leviticus. It's in her book, Purity and Danger. And uh, I think it's relevant to the homantash latka distinction. How is it relevant? Well, if I can, uh, I can show you on the board, actually. Oh, please. We you know that uh, the homantash is a triangle, and the latka is a kind of a round circle. Now, any anthropologist would know that we're dealing with a fundamental kinship convention where triangles are male and uh, circles are female. 
So we can call this Omantash and Laka. And you now we do things like this. So this would be a marriage between them. And this would be, well, actually, there's something going wrong here. Their offspring. An offspring that immediately calls into question this whole relationship because it's a hybrid, uh, which is in uh, Jewish tradition an abomination. Uh, so we have a problem here. This, this is clearly a misalliance in the Jewish tradition. And one of two things in that case, either it's too distant, that is like a marriage with a Gentile, or it's too close, it's incest. Uh, it's not likely to be incest uh, for a, a, a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that the, uh, the uh, partners are too different. They couldn't be very much from the same family since one is uh, baked and the other is fried. One is triangular, the other is round. Uh, one is sweet and the other is salty and so on. So the chances are that uh, one of these two people is a Gentile. How do we know which one? And is that and a how bad do we thing know which or one? a good thing? Yeah, now, now we have to find out which one. I think it's easy, pretty easy. First of all, Haman, Tashan, Haman by the other equinoctial uh, calendar, uh, holiday, Purim, is obviously an enemy. Haman, Haman Tash is uh, actually uh, a reference to Haman in many biblical or Talmudic uh, commentaries about these matters. Moreover, uh, since we're talking about Jewish tradition, we wouldn't be interested in this unless it was a Jewish tradition. And it's obvious that in the Jewish tradition, you have to be born of a Jewish woman to be Jewish. So. She is obviously Jewish, and he is apparently uh, not Jewish. Not only is he an enemy by Purim, but latke, I think, is a preferred food in many ways. I want to thank you for representing uh, uh, a field of inquiry, anthropology, that has a storied past here at the university. Before I let you go, I just need a clear statement. Whose side are you on here? Well, obviously, I'm on Latka's side. I mean, Homantashen is not Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> I give you marks for solids. My guest today is Professor James Heckman, the Henry Schultz Distinguished Service Professor in the Department of Economics. You have a work in progress, a fascinating paper called The Dynamic Model of Health addiction, education, and wealth. Exactly, this is very relevant to the debate. Yeah, in fact, it's also very University of Chicago because you start with a rational addiction model that Gary Becker and Kevin Murphy developed Correct. in 1988, right? Correct, yes, we start with that and build on it. In which and test it, actually. combine unhealthy addictive goods, right? Correct. Uh, so um, Smoking or eating foods that are not very healthy, yes. And then you go on in that paper to to, to evaluate the impact of revenue neutral excise taxes on unhealthy goods. Yes, correct. So, uh, and you show that the accumulation of addiction capital stock is governed by past history and is cumulative over time. Yes. So my question to you is, could you quantify, since you've shown us that the nutritional value of hamantashin is actually detrimental to education, attention, et cetera. In these early childhood. In these early childhood years. Correct, yes. And uh, that it's addictive. Yes. Uh, could you quantify um, through your rational uh, addiction model the cost to society, uh, or the, let's say the benefit to society of using latkes as snacks um, in, in early childhood education? Yes, actually this is a research area. We're right at the frontier in this particular area. And the reason is, it's well documented. See, one of, the, one of the great themes of the University of Chicago social science is how it straddles across the discipline. It's not just social science. You know, the old statement, I think, that Hayek made you, you know, the only person who, an economist who only does economics is not a very good economist. Here, we're borrowing from the biology and borrowing from the, uh, 
from the, the work on the nutrition. And what we found, and what's been found in the literature, is that sugar is far more addictive than other kinds of foods. So if you were to make a comparison, just to calibrate our model, this model of addiction, where consuming this food, sugar in this case, uh, in the form of the hamantashen, and also the flour. The flour is no good because that's turning into sugar as well. So that by itself is creating issues about health down the road, but it's also building a much greater addictive taste than, for example, the savory food, even the one that's more fat-based. Taxing this triangle turns out to have a welfare benefit in, in terms, terms of, of health income, and, and addiction. And addiction. addiction and behavior. So we're going to have less obesity, we're going to have greater health, much less diabetes. I mean, no question, the consuming sugar and the, 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 the flour that goes into the hamantashen. These better are educational outcomes. Much better educational outcomes, but also a bunch of other outcomes. Health, education, uh, participation in crime, I would argue, the ability to focus, self-control in a variety of areas of life. So if you start early on this addictive process of consuming sugar, it's going to be very hard when you're in your 30s or 40s to stop this process. And then the process of obesity will continue, the health problems will flourish, and uh, then society will have missed a great option for improving the life of its children. You heard it here, data-driven policy analysis from the Center for Economics of Human Development and its director, <laughs> James Heckman. Many thanks. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I'm here with Professor Solomon Hagel from the Committee on Social Thought at the University of Chicago. Professor Solomon Hagel is a distinguished authority on fundamental texts of the Western tradition, and uh, we're here to find out what he thinks about latka and hamantaschen. Could you perhaps begin by giving us some idea of what the Committee on Social Thought is? That is a very difficult question. The committee was formed by John Uneff, after whom it's named, uh, in the 1930s and 40s uh, in order to attract great minds. Professor Hegel, does the Committee on Social Thought have a position on uh, Latka versus Hamantaschen? Latka versus Hamantaschen. Well, you have to understand that the Committee on Social Thought is concerned with fundamental texts and fundamental questions. Uh, I can't think of any mention of a latka or of a hamantaschen in the texts that interest us. So Professor Hegel, are you telling us that the Committee on Social Thought and its approach to fundamental texts can tell us nothing about latkas or hamantaschen? Oh no. Certainly, social thought has something to say about latkes and hamantaschen. We have something to say about everything. Amongst the pre-Socratics, we would either say that latka and hamantaschen were actually both the same thing, since there is only oneness and sameness. I'm thinking here, obviously, of Parmenides. Or we could say with Heraclitus, that there is no one thing called a latka or called a hamantash, that they are constantly becoming different unto themselves. You cannot bite into the same latka twice. And then if I start to think about our other fundamental guiding star in the Committee on Social Thought, I'm speaking of Hegel, of course, I'd have to say that the problem looks somewhat similar. That is to say, you might begin with this antithesis that you seem to be posing to us here between a latka and a hamantaschen, or a hamantash, is that the singular? But in the end, these antitheses sublate and become one. All right, Professor Hegel, just, uh, if you could just tell me in, in one sentence then, I mean, do you come down on the side of the latka or on the side of the hamantash? Well, I would have to say either or. 
either you keep, or... You keep returning to the thing in itself. I tell you, we're not interested in the thing in itself. We're interested in the idea. The mind cannot reach the thing in itself. Surely you should know this. If you don't know this, then you belong in some vulgar disciplinary department, not in the Committee on Social Thought.